Salvetus Spectatoris. Let me ask you a question. Who is the boss of Germany? Merkel! Well, first of all, despite the perceived eternity of her reign, Angela Merkel is, as the politically up-to-date people among you already know, not anymore the federal chancellor of Germany. She was replaced with this gentleman over here, Mr. Olaf Scholz of the party SPD. When in December of 2021, the Bundestag elected him with the votes of the so-called Traffic Light Coalition's MPs. But even the answer, Scholz, would be incorrect, because despite the fact that the federal chancellor of Germany, without a doubt, is the most well-known and influential figure in German politics, officially it's the federal president, who is, as the head of state, Germany's number one. If you didn't know that, don't feel bad. Many people, probably including a shockingly high number of Germans, don't know. That's why I thought I'd use the fact that, as I'm writing this, the current president, Frank-Walter Steinmeier, has just recently been re-elected to make a video in which I'll talk a bit about the office of the federal president and we'll explore, among other things, how he's elected, what his powers and responsibilities are and, in the end, I shall quickly talk about some criticisms of the German presidency. But let's start with the facts. If you are a sigma-pilled individual and hear of such a prestigious position where you get to chill in a literal palace from the 1700s, one of your first questions would probably be, how the frick do I get this awesome job? So first of all, according to Article 54 of the Basic Law, you obviously need to be a German who is eligible to vote in federal elections. Unlike the United States, Germany does not have a requirement of a president being a natural-born citizen. Technically speaking, there are even rare circumstances under which someone who isn't a German citizen but is still considered a German under the basic law could become president because if you listen carefully, the requirement was being a German, not being a German citizen. The whole concept of German in the sense of the basic law is a whole other can of worms I will not open in this video, maybe in the future. Anyway, one requirement both countries share is a minimum age, which in Germany is 5 years older than in the United States with 40 instead of 35 years. The federal president is also limited to two terms, but of 5 years each. In order to avoid a conflict of interests, Article 55 clearly lays down a couple of incompatibilities with the office. The president may not be a member of the federal or any state's government or legislature and he also may not hold any other salaried office or engage in any trade or profession or belong to the management or supervisory board of any enterprise conducted for profit. This brings up another question. If the federal president is effectively barred from having another job, how much does he make? Apparently, 254,000 euros a year, plus an extra 78k euros, which he uses, among other things, for the wages of his domestic staff in the fully furnished official residence that he's provided with for free. So it's a pretty good deal, I suppose. When the president leaves office, he still receives a so-called honorary salary, but not with the extra money. Additionally, ex-presidents are given other benefits, like an office, for example. By the way, while doing my research, I read wildly varying amounts. I went with the numbers stated on the president's official website, thinking, if they don't know it, who else would? But everyone can earn a lot of money. Are there any other special non-monetary benefits the presidency offers? No. At least not if you don't see legal immunity as a benefit, since according to Article 60 of the Basic Law, the same immunity provisions that Article 46, Paragraph 2 to 4 
gifts to members of the Bundestag shall also apply to the federal president Mutatis Mutandis. Now, how does the election of the federal president work? Just in case you already don't like the US Electoral College since you think it isn't democratic enough for you, brace yourself because the way the German presidential election works is way worse in that regard. The election is supposed to happen every five years, but if the president for whatever reason leaves office early, so will the next election happen earlier. His term can also be extended in the case of Germany being in a state of defense. Let's now talk about how the president gets elected. The president is elected by the so-called Bundesversammlung, in English Federal Assembly or Federal Convention. It's a non-standing body whose only purpose is to elect a new president and thus only ever meets for that occasion not later than 30 days before the expiration of the term of the current federal president. It consists of all the members of the Bundestag, Germany's de facto lower house, whose president is also ex officio the leader of the assembly, and an equal number of delegates elected by the state legislatures, thus making it Germany's largest parliament or, let's be real, parliament-ish institution. The number of delegates each state gets to send is relative to their population of German citizens. They are elected by proportional vote of the respective state legislature. Thus, it's not like that the state's governing coalition can just use their majority to choose all of them, but rather that, let's say, if there's a hypothetical state XYZ that has 50 seats in the federal assembly and a 100 members strong state legislature, which is made up of 40 party A, 30 party B, 20 party C and 10 party D MPs, this would mean that as long as all MPs vote along party lines, party A would get to choose 20, party B 15, party C 10 and party D 5 electors the state XYZ sends to the federal assembly. Who those delegates are is pretty irrelevant as long as they would be electable in a general federal election, so Germans over 18 who haven't lost their right to be elected as a result of a criminal conviction and so on. And indeed, the state legislators often use this characteristic of the law to nominate celebrities, former politicians etc. In theory, they could also nominate completely random citizens, which obviously would, from the politician's perspective, be quite the gamble since all electors, according to section 8 of the law on the election of the federal president by the federal assembly, are not bound by any orders and instructions and thus could vote however they want and even propose their own presidential candidate. Generally speaking though, the election of the German president is quite predictable and thus sadly rather boring since, first of all, in reality obviously each party decides beforehand who they want to field as a candidate, but from the excitement factor even worse, in many cases multiple parties who have a combined majority get together before the election and agree upon a common candidate, who then obviously wins the required absolute majority in the first round of voting. If such an arrangement did not occur, it would still be not uncommon that other parties would drop their candidate to support one of the two strongest candidates, thus potentially deciding the whole thing in the second round. And even if there was zero cooperation between the parties or only between parties that combined don't have the absolute majority, in the third round of voting the largest party or block of parties will always win because then only a plurality of votes is required to elect the president. Now let's say you have just been freshly elected as federal president of Germany. You took your oath of office. Ich schwöre, 
dass ich meine Kraft dem Wohle des deutschen Volkes widmen, seinen Nutzen mehren, Schaden von ihm wenden, das Grundgesetz und die Gesetze des Bundes wahren und verteidigen, meine Pflichten gewissenhaft erfüllen und Gerechtigkeit gegen jedermann üben werde, so wahr mir Gott helfe. What powers are you now vested with? What are your responsibilities? So let's take a look at a non-complete list of the powers and responsibilities of the federal president. Representing the federation in international law, concluding treaties with foreign states on behalf of the federation, accrediting and receiving envoys, appointing and dismissing federal judges, federal civil servants and commissioned and non-commissioned officers of the armed forces unless otherwise provided by law, exercising the power to pardon offenders on behalf of the federation in individual cases so a federal amnesty would be subject to federal law, proposing the federal chancellor to the Bundestag, appointing the federal chancellor after being elected by the Bundestag, dissolving parliament in certain cases, appointing and dismissing federal ministers upon the proposal of the federal chancellor, proclaiming the state of defense in the Federal Law Gazette, certifying federal laws and after signing them, promulgating them in the Federal Law Gazette, approving the rules of procedure adopted by the federal government. Those aren't all the tasks the federal president has, but in my opinion, the most important ones. Two other relevant pieces of information are that he may delegate the powers enumerated in Article 60 to other authorities, which is clear because obviously he can't individually appoint every single civil servant or military officer. And Article 58 of the Basic Law states that orders and directions of the federal president shall require for their validity the countersignature of the federal chancellor or of the competent federal minister, unless it's about the appointment or dismissal of the federal chancellor, the dissolution of the Bundestag under Article 63 or requesting the federal chancellor and federal ministers to continue to manage the affairs of their respective office until a successor is appointed or elected thus further restricting his powers. As you could already see, the federal president's role is rather a ceremonial one and while it's not a legal requirement, the president customarily does not engage in day-to-day, -day, let alone partisan politics. So now you know that the difference between the German and American president is massive, but Germany at least also has a vice president, right? Wrong. Because if the federal president is unable to perform his duties or if his office falls prematurely vacant, the president of the Bundesrat shall exercise his powers. And what could reasons be for that being the case? Death, resignation or impeachment. And with this wonderful transition, we shall now come to our last stop on our journey through the wonderful world of facts about the German federal president. Impeachment. How does it work? Well, the process is described in Article 61 of the Basic Law and works as follows. Firstly, for the motion of impeachment to even be considered, it must be supported by at least one quarter of the Bundesrat or the Bundestag. The actual decision to impeach requires a two-thirds majority and, if it passes, the case shall be presented before the Federal Constitutional Court by a member of the Bundestag or Bundesrat. If the Federal Constitutional Court finds the federal president guilty of a willful violation of the basic law or any other federal law, it may declare that he has forfeited his office. After the president has been impeached, the court may issue an interim order preventing him from exercising his functions. That were all the, in my opinion, important or at least interesting facts about the federal president of the Federal Republic of Germany. But before I'll end this video altogether, I wanted to talk about some of the complaints some people have about the way the presidency in Germany works. And for transparency's sake, I have to say, I'm a big critic of that part and 
to be honest many other parts of the German political and governmental system myself, so of course I might have a bias. The first and most obvious point of criticism is obviously the very undemocratic way the president is elected. Now one could say, well technically the electors are elected by the people or in the case of the state delegates at least elected by people who were elected by the people. Firstly, I hope you listened to yourself talking and heard how absurd and undemocratic the whole thing, especially the last part sounded. Secondly, the electors elected by the state legislatures, as mentioned earlier, are often just celebrities, so only they themselves and God knows who they will vote for, regardless of who elected them and what their constituents' wishes are. Furthermore, even the electors who got their role ex officio because they are members of the Bundestag and thus either directly elected by the population of their district or at least through people voting for their party list aren't necessarily representing the people's will, either because, for example, the voters may have voted for party A, but they absolutely can't stand party A's candidate for president they end up nominating. Or even worse, someone votes for party B because they absolutely can't stand party A, but then party B makes an agreement with party A supporting party A's candidate for presidency. Lastly, I gotta say that the whole election process, in my opinion at least, is rather reminiscent of an electoral monarchy at worst and an aristocratic republic at best, where a bunch of rich and powerful people get together to choose who amongst their ranks shall be the next head of state of those peasants who can't be trusted with making this decision on their own? Not really worthy of a country that claims to be a democratic representative republic, if you ask me. I'd take the electoral college whose function at least serves a defensible purpose every day over this system. The reason why the president isn't elected by the people, that the people can't be trusted, is even more ridiculous when considering that he barely has any real power to abuse, even when compared to the monarch in many modern constitutional monarchies. I'm not here to argue in favor or against an expansion of the president's power, but the criticism oftentimes levied is that effectively every couple of years a new president is elected whose official function is derided by some as just being the country's highest notary and who is de facto a powerless figurehead, even more so than let's say the Queen of England. The difference obviously being that a century old monarchy has a higher symbolic and unifying value and that the British taxpayer does not have to pay a lot of money for a whole bunch of former presidents who are still around. And I'm saying that as a pretty strong believer in republicanism. It's probably quite the stereotypical German argument complaining about something's perceived uselessness and the lack of fiscal responsibility caused by paying for it. So the TLDR, the election is too undemocratic and the office too politically irrelevant to spend that much money on it. Obviously those were just some criticisms of how the German presidency works, but in my opinion enough for this video. Speaking of my opinion, if you want to hear my opinion on this issue, or maybe even the German governmental system in general, let me know in the comment section below, where you by the way should definitely comment anything you want to say, for it's good for the algorithm, or write it on the official Fries and Ice Discord server, linked in the video description. Don't forget to subscribe to this and the second channel, and follow the wonderful Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash fries are nice underscore. If you liked this video, please leave a like and share this video with your friends, with your mutuals, on social media, on discord, on reddit, I don't care. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching this video that by the way wasn't legal advice. If you want to become president of Germany, talk to a German attorney or to a career counselor I suppose. <laughs> See you next time. Until then, stay presidential. And most importantly, stay crispy.